Hello everyone and welcome to today's live broadcast, Standards and Regulations for Animal Use in Research, Challenges and Changes in a Chilean University. I am Marcel Perregentil and I'll be your moderator. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit your questions by typing them in the Q&A box which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would like now to introduce uh, today's speaker and my friend Dr. Andrea Leisewitz. Dr. Leisewitz is the research ethics officer at Pontifico, a Catholic university in Chile. She also serves as a biosafety and biosecurity officer at the university. I will now turn it over to Dr. Lesewitz for her presentation. Uh, thanks, Marcel. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrea, and I'm the current research ethics and security officer of the Pontificia Universidad Católica in Chile in South America. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank Marcel and all the organizers for inviting me to share with you our experience in, um, in trying to do things right here in Chile, uh, especially in our institution. So what I'm gonna talk today and show to you is how in just a couple of years, a couple of years we, we changed um, the whole research ethics system within the university and especially for animals uh, and animal uh, care. Um, so first of all, um, I'm gonna start with uh, telling you about our regulatory context, our legislation um, and a little bit of history. And you will see that it's very recent. Um, then I'm gonna talk about what was really happening in reality uh, compared to what is supposed to be happening. Um, then some events that we got uh, here in Chile and at our institution, and then the new model that we are implementing um, in our university. So I'm gonna start with what was our regulatory context. Um, so um, as you can see here, our legislation is very recent our legislation regarding research ethics. So it was just in 1999, early 2000s, that we got uh, the law 19628, that is about protection of private life. This, this re regulations talk about um, what kind of data is private and what kind of data is not private. Uh, then five years later, uh, we, well, we adhere to the UNESCO uh, declaration. So uh, in 2005, it was this uh, universal declaration on bioethics and human rights um, uh, of the UNESCO. And it was in the same year where um, our main funding agency, Fondesit, um, built up an advisory board uh, on research ethics or in bioethics. So it was 2005, just in 2005, where like our, our NIH, like funding agency, um, decided to take care about uh, research ethics um, in our country. So uh, it was the, the next year in 2006, where the law 20,120 about scientific research in human beings and its genome and prohibits human cloning. That's the name of, of the law uh, that came up. But in Chile, things are kind of special and we need a regulation act where it's an act that 
stages how to implement different laws. So as you can see, he, uh, the Regulation Act from, uh, from this law in 2006 just came up in 2011, late 2011, early 2012. So it, it was just six years later that this, this law started to be applied. And that, that was the main issue. Uh, it was just two or three years ago, just very recent. In 2009, we got this law, the 20,380, about animal protection. And that's, this is our first law that talks a little bit, not all of the law, but just there, it has a part about animal experimentation. And it was in 2009. So uh, what does this law say? Um, this law recognizes animals as living beings capable to feel and that are subject to receive adequate treatment, avoiding unnecessary suffering. Uh, I highlighted unnecessary suffering because this is the main contribution of this law, in my, in my opinion. Um, this law has a focus on education and in, on responsible pet ownership. So the main focus of this law is to teach or the community to be responsible with their pets and not, it doesn't care very much about uh, animal experiment or experimentation with animals. It defines experiment in live animals as any use in order to test a scientific hypothesis, try a natural or synthetic product, producing medical or biological substances of use, uh, detect phenomena, materials, or effect, making, teaching, demonstration, perform operations, and in general study and know their behavior. That's the definition of experiment in live animals. It's very broad. Um, this law also says that the experiments on living animals may only be performed by qualified personnel, but it doesn't say what does it mean qualified personnel. Um, also, it says that uh, the, it is required the use of anesthesia to avoid unnecessary suffering in surgeries and that procedures must be performed by a veterinarian or other qualified professional. That is, again, not defined what is an, a qualified professional. Um, then it says that such experiments must be practices, must be practiced in appropriate facilities. That is, again, not defined what is an appropriate facility. We can imagine that it's a, I don't know, an, opera an, a, an operation room or a procedure room, uh, but it, it's not specified. And the permission uh, to conduct such, such experiments must be granted by the high school principal, if it is uh, performed in a, in a school, or the dean of the respective faculty if it is in a university. And finally, requires the use of rational methods for animal sacrifice aimed at causing unnecessary distress. That is not defined. It is not defined what is a rational method for animal sacrifice. So um, there are some key concepts in this law regarding animal um, experimentation. Um, the law is longer and it, it covers other items regarding um, education and teaching and, and responsible ownership of animals. But regarding uh, animal experimentation, it says unnecessary suffering. Uh, something that is very important is that the owner's responsibility, the animals are the owner's responsibility, the owners are responsible for their animals. And if we extrapolate to researchers, I will say that the researchers or the investigators are responsible of the animals that they keep in uh, animal facility. Uh, it mentions qualified personnel, appropriate facilities, and rational methods for animal sacrifice. And it, at the end of the law, it is stated that the Regulation Act will grant guidelines and mechanisms to implement this law. But it's February 2015 and still we don't have any regulation act. Supposedly, and as the law stated, um, it was, it stated that six months after, um, after the law enactment, uh, um, a board should have been constituted to, um, 
to develop or to um, to develop this regulation act or to state the guidelines that we need but it is February 2015 and we still don't have any uh, regulation act so as our Chilean as I was saying our Chilean culture so we need a regulation act to implement laws um, nobody's implementing anything regarding animal experimentation because we don't have regulation act in general terms okay so how was or how is the status of IACOCs or research ethics committees or IRBs in general in Chile um, as I said in 2005 uh, the main funding agency that is a governmental funding agency fund the cities like our NIH um, and so it was uh, created this bioethic advisory board that the main goal was to check all the bioethics or the ethical considerations uh, in their proposal that they were funding. Um, so uh, that, made, that made the institutions or the research institutions as universities uh, to have their own research ethics board or research ethics committees to review the proposals that we're going to apply to grants funded by Fondacy, but this, but this agency. Uh, also, uh, in the, what was required starting 2006 um, to apply to these grants was, the, was um, that Institutional Research Ethics Committee should review and approve uh, new proposals that will apply to Fondacy uh, uh, grants. So uh, that made um, that in, within 2005 and 2006, uh, most of research ethics committees were uh, funded or were created within research, uh, uh, research institution or universities. So in, in our institution in particular, um, the School of Medicine was concerned before 2005 regarding um, ethical approval of protocols that were using um, human subjects or, or patients. Uh, so the, the, the IRB or the Research Ethics Committee or Research Ethics Committee regarding human subjects in the School of Medicine was created before 2005, but that was one of the only one uh, examples that of, 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 of um, creation of, of of committees before the law or the fundacy's requirements. But the main, the main ethics committees came up within, um, in 2005, the end of 2005 and 2006. So what was the need? What, what uh, these committees were, why these committees were created? So fundacy, this main funding agency, started to request for the application purposes a document indicating that the researchers um, that the, the researcher that is applying requested the ethical revision of its proposal so at the begin uh, at the beginning of the application so fund uh, um, receives these documents uh, this document is like a letter uh, saying that the researcher uh, presented all the documentation to the research ethic committee, so it will be reviewed. After 90 days approximately, uh, the researcher has to submit the approval, uh, the ethical approval to Fondacy. Uh, that is before the resolution, that is before the grant, uh, the grant um, results, right, the application results. Um, and then um, researchers need, the need was that, the re, that it was required to show these documents. So researchers need a research ethic committees uh, or a research ethic committee that gives them the documentation they need to apply to these grants, right, to this um, funding agency. So, well, so in Chile, there was no culture about what a research ethic committee should do. So the result of this um, request by Fondacy was that uh, it was a reactive solution, right? So a lot of 
committees were created everywhere. So there were no guidelines. Nobody cared about regulations or guidelines. They just, they just wanted to support researchers in the grant application process. So it was kind of disorganized everywhere. Um, anyway, so that was the result. And as an example, in our institution, in the Pontificia Universidad Católica, that is one of the main research institutions in Chile, so we have 18 schools, and until last year, uh, middle of 2014, uh, there were 24 research ethics committees constituted, uh, responding to this need or to this necessity of researchers to have support for their uh, grant application process. Um, about 120 faculty members working in one of these committees, um, most of them, but not all of them, uh, but most of them were not aware, as I said, about the national re uh, legislation or international guidelines. So, uh, so all the requirements, all the processes were very, you know, variable among these 24 committees. Um, so uh, the committee members in general were working about uh, eight hours per month uh, in average. Uh, of course, during the period of time that is, there was grant application, you know, weeks, so they were working more and there were periods of the year that they didn't meet. Um, in, in average, they were working about eight to 10 hours uh, per month, per member of the, these research ethic committees. It was extra work uh, and no support. So uh, it was something that it was, um, so the, it, it was something that, that uh, a group of faculty members decided to do this kind of work to review the ethical aspect of, of the proposals um, because the researchers needed that. Uh, for their application process. So because we had a lot of members and with different backgrounds and different at different schools and with different requirements, so all the requirements, the ethical requirements or the ethical consideration that they took, that they considered to approve or not the, the proposal was very variable and not established. Not So there was no continuity in one year after the other year. So, you know, it was very messy that that's the message. Um, and of course, it was not according uh, to the national legislation because they didn't know about the national, nas national legislation. Uh, regarding the management, it was practically non-existent. There were not, pol not policies, internal policies, uh, no training, not even training for the, um, research ethic committee's members. Uh, there were a lot of conflict of interest. There were deans uh, uh, being the, the chair of the research ethic committee. And of course, the dean wanted more uh, proposals to be applied uh, to get more money, uh, more funding. And, and of course, you know, you, we can think that there were a lot of conflict of interest. Um, within these committees. Um, there were no regular meetings, they were meeting just by necessity, etc. So the problem uh, was high workload, no motivation of, of the committee members, no researchers trained, they didn't care about training researchers regarding the ethical aspects of the proposals. Um, of course, with, it was a high member change. Every year they were changing committee members and that was, you know, not, but that, that was again, that went against uh, the continuity of, of, the, of the committee. Uh, and of course it was a lot, it was considered as a bureaucratic uh, or a bureaucracy. Anyway, so how was this, this is very global, all research ethic committees, human, animals, etc. So. How was the status of the um, research ethic committees in, in, in animal care and use? So in our institution, there were four schools, the Faculty of Biological Science, School of Medicine, Faculty of Chemistry, and Faculty of Agronomy. Each of them had one animal care and use committee. 
uh, the main the main ones were from the Faculty of Biological Science and the School of Medicine that were reviewing about 150 protocols, the Faculty of Biological Science, and around 60 or 70 um, protocols at the School of Medicine. At the Faculty of Chemistry and Faculty of Agronomy, they were reviewing re about five or six a year, uh, protocols a year. Um, anyway, these four animal care and use committees had different composition, different protocols and different documentation. They requested different kind of uh, documentation. They requested different uh, information within these documents. Uh, so the, it was very variable what the requirements were to approve a protocol. Um, and they had different criteria to evaluate them, of course. Um, so I, I was part at that time, I was part of the School of Medicine and I was part of the committee uh, that is the Ethics and Animal Welfare Committee at the School of Medicine, SEBA in its um, Spanish. Um, uh, that's, it's, it's from uh, Comité de Ética and Bienestar Animal, that is in Spanish. Uh, so here I show um, how many new proposals we were uh, reviewing. So the, this, this committee was funded in 2008 uh, not in 2005 or six, like the others. The, the Committee of the uh, Faculty of Biological Science was funded in 2006. This is two years later. Um, so this year, so we started reviewing about 30 or 40 protocols a year, and we end up 2014 reviewing about 70 protocols. Um, and it was in 2012, that something changed um, within the requirements of our main, main funding agency, Fundacid. So Fundacid, uh, aligned with the national legislation, uh, started to require protocol follow-up um, at least once during the, 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 the time that the protocol is active or the, the, the funding is active. Um, it started to require site visits and reports. So, and reports by the Institutional Research Ethics Committee or by the SEVA or the committee that was in charge at the moment. So, uh, this year was a year that, that, you know, things got complicated for, the, for our system because uh, it was for the committees it was okay to support their um, their researchers and approve their protocols so they get can apply to more funding but now uh, the same committees had to do these protocol follow-ups and make some reports and submit them to the funding agency um, and that was a major major issue in our, our culture and our institution so people didn't like it uh, it was complicated. So, uh, and then we, as the committee at School of Medicine that was uh, in, in care, uh, taking care of the, the animal protocols, we started to, uh, to change our, our criteria. We started to, to study international guidelines. That was a little bit before, of course, that the year before at the end of 2010 and beginning of 2011 because we knew that it was, this was coming and we knew that we needed to work more and, and, and we needed to, to do this uh, right. Um, so we started to compare um, in our uh, follow-ups or our site visit, we started to compare what researchers indicated in the protocol that we approved uh, with what they were actually doing. So we found a lot of uh, inconsistency, of course. So they promised something in their documentation, but they were doing different things in reality. So that was um, an opportunity to teach them and to, and to educate them in good practices. And, in, 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 you know, so if, if you promise something, if you decided to use this anesthesia, you should use that anesthesia. If, if you are going to change that drug, so just ask the committee and you need approval, et cetera. So we started, we started uh, educating a lot um, our researchers. 
again, this is just the School of Medicine. Our university is bigger than that, but at least we were working on that. Um, a, a, a very important person was hired at the School of Medicine that is, that, that's uh, Jessica Gimpel, that is a veterinarian. She has a PhD in animal welfare from Oxford. And she was uh, crucial to develop all this new um, way of doing things. Uh, so it was the same time, the end of 2011, beginning of 2012. But of course, this meant a high workload for our committee. Uh, but we understood that our role as, co as the Animal Welfare Committee was of highest importance. So uh, we wanted to do things right and educate our researchers in good practices. So that was, you know, our main goal. And, 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 and we decided to take that challenge. So um, our, our committee was, as I said, was uh, funded in 2009, uh, in 2008, was funded. It started uh, in, in in reality. Started working in 2009, and our first main goal was, of course, as any other research ethic committees, to support uh, our researchers in the application process. But then we, we moved, and we understood understood, as I said, uh, that we wanted uh, that this was of highest importance, and and we took that as a challenge. So it was in 2012, at the same time that we started to do the site visits, um, that the chair, that was me at the time, um, that the chair uh, requested uh, protected time to dedicate uh, to the committee. So I was a, a researcher, had my own lab, I was doing, I had uh, some funding uh, proposals, I was teaching, and the, this was extra work, but I understood that it, it was of highest importance. And with Jessica's support, so I went uh, to my dean and I asked for protected time. And, and he understood, and he understood that this was of highest importance. So he gave me the protected time. And that was amazing because it was, you know, something that we didn't expect. Of another another uh, event that we had in 2012 was an activism event. It was very violent and it was, um, something that uh, changed our uh, dean's view of what research ethics and how to deal with um, animal activism. Uh, so he understood that and, and he it was together with you know this protected time and to understand that that we needed uh, we needed support uh, to do things right and to protect our researchers and to do research right and to show the world and especially the the activists that we try to keep our, you know, our um, our animal experience within, you know, certain limits and using the three R's and and trying to to avoid unnecessary suffering, etc. So what happened? That was in, in our our own institution, the Pontificia Universidad Católica. But what happened at the national level? We decided to. Uh, to check what it was happening in other research institutions. So we made a survey that we got about 18 answers. So uh, we have more than 18 uh, research institutions, but it was okay. So what we did, we were very careful. We submitted a one-to-one -one email, so knowing people because we know that activism is getting, animal activism is getting really strong here in Chile. So we were very careful. We got 18 answers, uh, and uh, most of them, most of the research institution had a committee, a research ethic committee regarding animal care and use. Um, the answers were variable when we asked if if the dependency of the committee was by faculty or by school or at the institutional level. So. It wasn't clear. Most of them believed that it was institutional, but not very sure. So, but at least most of the research institutions had a uh, um, an, an research ethic committees or an kind of IACOC. And this answer, when we asked about meeting frequency, it was very interesting because most of them were meeting by necessity. I, I mean. 
uh, when they get a lot of protocols, they meet. If they don't get any protocol, they don't meet. Um, and that, that goes against, um, you know, continuity and, and against, goes against what a committee should do in times of low work when, when they have time to establish criteria, to develop uh, procedures and manuals and guidelines. But anyway, so that, that, it wasn't very different as in our institution at that time. So, so in general, it was not only us. So every research institution had the same kind of structure. I'm not showing all the data. If you want the, the survey data, I can share it with you. But um, most of them had the same structure. Most of them were um, faculty members with no training, um, with no experience, but just trying to support you know, research in their institution. They have the same problems. Most of them didn't have any um, authority support, so no money to 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 work or to for the meetings or so it was very you know uh, you know a group of of faculty members that wanted to help others. That that was that was that's the same the, the same thing that we had. So we decided after that to do this the first laboratory animal care and use committee meeting. We decided to meet with all of them. Uh, and that happened in July 2013. Um, the main goals were, of course, to meet, to know each other, and to establish a network so we can share our experiences, our, our documents, our guidelines, or, you know, anything to support each other. Uh, another main goal was to unify some basic revision criteria. We invited to this uh, to this uh, meeting uh, people from uh, the Fundacid program from our NIH, the main funding agency, and they were very delighted to hear that we wanted to make a proposal to the country, right, through Fundacid, through this um, main agency regarding what the guidelines should, or, or the criteria should be to uh, review animal protocol, or animal experimentation protocols. And of course, establish some agreements. That was uh, uh, one of the main goals. So what we did was, uh, and, and in the end, we wanted to do this, uh, to do a document to, to send, uh, to, send uh, to, to the main funding agency, fund the city. Um, so we did presentations, we did discussion groups, and we 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 agree in some some things. Uh, we decided to to so we established the the network. We have the network that is named Red Siguales, um, and um, and then we decided to make a one national protocol, one national document where. Uh, the researchers should fill up and, and then submit to their own IACUC or research ethic committees, committee. Um, we are working on this document. Um, and we decided to follow the guide for, for the care and use of non uh, laboratory animals of an NRC, um, these standards. So, you know, it was very, very nice. It was a, a three day meeting. Um, and I think it was very fruitful. And now um, we are going to have the second laboratory animal meeting um, care and use committee uh, in August this year. So we'll see and, and we'll see what, you know, what's the status of the other IACOCs. Um, so uh, again, um, coming back to this, we had this activism event. Uh, we had, uh, we had at the same time, we needed to do this protocol follow-up in 2000, starting in 2012. And, and when this happened, we as a committee, as a committee from the School of Medicine, um, we went to the dean and we asked if we have as a school of medicine or as a uni university, as an institution, if we have an emergency plan against activism events. Um, uh, and, and nobody knew <laughs> at that moment. Um, and then uh, we went uh, to the vice presidents for research uh, at that moment to ask them, that's the, uh, vice, the 
the person that is in charge of whole, the whole research areas in the university, not by faculty, but at the university level. And he didn't know at that time uh, what to do in case of, of activism events. Um, he said, okay, um, so we don't, we don't have any emergency plan, but the one that should know about that is the vice president of, for communications of the university. So we went there and we came up with an emergency plan because there was no emergency plan against activism. So that was a big, big issue and that was nice to, 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 to have now. So um, it took about a year to get that. So that was, that was a, a high improvement. And the other issue that the vice president for research commented us at that time, this is the end of 2012, if it was how were the research ethic committees by school were planning to do the protocol follow-ups. And, and he asked us to unify the four uh, research ethic committees in animal or animal welfare committees from these four schools in one. And he requested us to guide or to be the leaders in this unification or uni you know, making one committee. Um, so uh, we started working and unify, unify them all. And we came up with this proposed work plan. So first of all, we had to define well, what is going to be the composition of the committee, to recruit committee members, to define procedures. We decided to work, of course, uh, under the guidance of the guide, uh, of the NRC guide, uh, define attributions and duties of the committee members, uh, training, et cetera, et cetera. And it was at the same time, that was the end of 2012, uh, that we were working in unify them, all the animal care and use committees within the university, uh, leading by the School of Medicine. And, and apparently the university was more concerned that uh, they, they said, and, and he opened up a new position at the end of December 2012. And he were requesting, requesting someone to take care of the whole research ethics and security uh, of the university, an institutional research ethics and security officer position. So, um, so they were concerned about, issue, about issues regarding research ethics in general. IRB, IACOC security, not only animals, but also, um, also um, human or research with human subjects. So I applied and I got the position and that, that's why I'm the, the institutional research ethics and security officer right now. But, um, but again, uh, I, I think it was because we were, we as a SEVA or as a committee within the School of Medicine decided to take this challenge as a kind of personal challenge or kind of highest importance uh, challenge. So Probably that's why we are, I'm here, right? Um, so um, at the beginning of 2013, uh, the Research Ethics and Security Office was created. I was the only member of that office. Um, now we are more, but more people working here. But um, our main goal um, as an office, an office was to ensure research ethics and integrity from the conception of the proposal until the end of its execution, through, develop, through the development of policies promoting good scientific practices and supporting the work of the research ethic committees and establishing together with these committees training instances on ethics, integrity, and security of research um, for members of the university's community, of all people that need uh, training in these areas. So uh, the first thing that we needed to do was to develop, develop policies, uh, institutional policies regarding research ethics. So it was in last July, 2014, that uh, the new regulation and the new policy came up. We worked about a year and a half in this policy and, and it was approved uh, in, in July, 2014. Um, 
and uh, this policy is uh, created, institu created, created, ah, created institutional research ethic committees established. It established uh, functions and mechanism how to do, uh, how to implement the functions, right? Uh, how the, the committees can, can, can do. They have to review, they have to do follow-ups, they have to uh, submit uh, reports, etc. Also, it defines what, is, what research means for us as an institution, as, the, as a Pontificia Universidad Católica. Of course, according to national legislation and international guidelines, but also because we are Catholic, we have some, you know, other, other regulations that apply, uh, that apply to us. Uh, it established committees, researchers, and institutions' responsibilities, and that's very important. So what are the responsibilities of a researcher, of the committee, and what uh, are the responsibilities of the institution? Uh, establishes uh, training as a requirement. So now on, all our researchers must do some training in research ethics, integrity, and security. Uh, and if our researchers are going to work with animals, they will sh they will need to show their training in research uh, uh, with animals or in, in, in animal, you know, handling and stuff. So, and also uh, it, it established the function of our office. Um, so, so now we have, so this is our university and now we have three, we created three major, uh, three, um, research ethic committees. We have one in biomedical science, another one in social behavioral um, art and humanities. And the third one is in animal care and use. Uh, and also we created a security committee. And, and why we don't call them biosecurity is because we have some security issues um, in all of three uh, research main fields, right? And we need to take care and to educate our people um, in security, like uh, risk, risk prevention, that I don't know how to say that, but, um, and also biosecurity. So we cover more than just biosecurity. And this committee uh, is an advisory committee that uh, bring risk management, thanks. <laughs> um, so this committee um, elaborates um, reports to each research ethic committee regarding the particular proposal and, and is the, the research ethic committee, the IRB or the IACUC, the one that decides to approve or not uh, the proposal, uh, uh, taking in consideration our evaluation of security or our security evaluation. So the next the next uh, goal is to establish training instances um, in ethics, integrity, and security. So we are developing now, so the committees were just um, created or the, the members were recruited last November, so three months ago. Uh, and now our goal is to, is to develop some um, training instances for our graduate students, for our uh, community, uh, committee members and the rest of researchers and faculty members. And also that's our first goal. And there are second probably uh, in another, in, in a year or so, we will develop some training instances to other kind of people like uh, technicians um, and undergrad students. But our main goal is to, to educate our, our researchers. And we, we, um, we got the city program, the one that the, the collaborative initiative of, of training uh, of the University of Miami that has a lot of information that is very useful for us, of course, and I know that it's very useful for everybody. So we are developing um, some profiles that are, are you know, trying to um, in, to include some information regarding our national reality, like our like our legislation and other issues that are particular to our country, um, but of course, uh, you know, this training instance is very useful for us. It has a lot of information, and I, I think it will be great for the beginning uh, to start with. Um, but also, we need we feel that it's very important to have on-site. Uh, 
um, you know, you, uh, case analysis talks and debates that should be on site, especially for our grad stu students, because it will e exemplify what they read uh, in the city program, right? What they, you know, all the contents to, to put in a more applied example. And that probably that will, that will help them to understand all the ethical considerations in every area, not only animal, animal care and use, but of course in every, you know, in, in, in uh, human subject, etc. And um, so our, what, so I, I just mentioned that our IACOC uh, was uh, conformed in no last November. And, you know, this is the composition. We have an external member. We have a certified veterinarian. We have a lawyer. We need that, we feel that it's very important to have a lawyer in our committees, especially in the IACOC because, um, you know, with all the activism that is going on and, and we, you know, we need as an institution that we can, we can propose a lot of um, guidelines to the rest of our country um, because we are a big university. There are instances that we can go and, and, and propose to the government some changes, maybe help in the development of the Regulation Act from our law regarding animals, uh, protection, etc. So, so we need a lawyer and, and it's very important, I think, for every, you know, IRB or IACOC. So we have researchers that work with laboratory animals, researchers that work with big animals like cows and, and you know, other big animals. Um, we have other kind of researchers, uh, such as statisticians. We feel that it's very important uh, to have a statistician in our IACOC because of the reduce, you know, the, the R uh, to reduce and to justify how many animals you need to, to do or to, to submit to a procedure to get our reliable da data. And, and that will help us to reduce a lot of our, our numbers. Um, and we, that's a major, another, you know, big thing is that we have a full-time um, assistant that is a veterinarian that is in charge of the management of the committee, but also is a committee member. And she, she's, uh, she's hired full-time and she helps a lot. So having people uh, with protected time or uh, full-time people working in the committee helps a lot. And especially in our institution that is very big. Um, so the effects of the, this new policy is that all the 24 research ethic committees, the local RECs disappeared just now in December 2014. Uh, three institutional research ethic committees were created. Um, we, we hope that these three are enough to review all the research protocols um, of our university, but maybe it won't. So, it, you know, this is like, uh, this year will be a testing year. Um, of course, we are trying to be aligned with the national legislation and international guidelines. Um, we have a centralized management and, um, and responsibility of research ethics, integrity and security. That's very good. I'm, a, I'm hired full time here now. And, and we are trying to develop, you know, this cultural change. We have to change a lot of, you know, old researchers that were used to do things in another way. So, you know, it will be a, a lot of work, but it's very challenging, but it's very, you know, gratifying that we are trying to do things right. Um, we are facing, of course, a big, 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 big challenge. And so we have just, you know, to give you a, like, a, how big is our institution? We have about 23,000 undergrad students, about 3,000 master's students, about 1,000 PhD students, and approximately 5,000 faculty members that do research and that have research protocols and that apply to, you know, fund the funding to our, you know. So it's a lot, a lot of work. And we expect about 2,500 new proposals this year. And probably uh, it will be more, but that's what we expect. So hopefully, I'm, so I'm not sure if, 
you know, it's too much, but, but anyway. So, um, some conclusions of this. It was a reactive solution, but I guess we are in the right way. Uh, the main advantage that we had is that people that detected the needs and the problems and look for a solution um, as a challenge and opportunity, it's a challenge and opportunity to do things better. We knocked at every door, we exposed the authorities, you know, the problems, the need, the importance of this, and they supported us. And that's, you know, the major change here, and that was a major sign for us uh, that we are in the right way, and we, you know, and, and, and we had the support, and they gave us resources, and, and so, it's a, you know, institutional commitment now. That's, that's awesome. Anyway, so we expect for IACUC about 500 new proposals, about 200 uh, research projects that will require follow-up this year, and about, you know, 50 PhD students that will need training in animal welfare and animal handling, so probably we'll have, our IACUC will have a lot of work. And wish me luck, because I don't have any results here yet. So probably next year I can talk to you about uh, results. So thank you, um, and thanks again to the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to show you how, you know, in South America, in Chile, that is, you know, a fairly organized country, um, things are very way behind as other countries in terms of research ethics. But we are trying to, you know, catch up. So thanks, and I will get any answers. Um, let me do this. Ooh. Well, thank you, Andrea, for the good presentation. And I was aware of some of the issues in Chile, and but you went in depth, and that was good for me to know. Wow, you have a lot ahead of you, but you've made incredible progress. And I know because I, we've spoken before and well, congratulate you and commend you for such admirable work. So before we get started on the Q&A session, I would like to remind you that how to submit your questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And let's see what, what our first question is. Okay, our first question comes from Maria Andres from Cellular and Molecular Biology. Don't you think that to ask for approval for any change in the protocol will slow the speed of research and it will increase enormously the work of the committee isn't it better to have a standard, to have standard protocols approved in advance? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for that question. Um, so uh, there are things that, that um, so any change in the protocol, it, it will mean minor or big change. If you want to change like the, the, the number of animals that you need uh, and you increase the number, for example, from 10 to 100, you should justify and that should be reviewed by the, by the, by the full committee. Uh, there are minor changes that maybe will have expedite revision and won't, won't slow down that, um, that the, the, the speed of research, as you say. Um, we are working and have standard protocols. We are working also in a manual to have like standardized procedures that will be approved if you just mentioned that, uh, that, that uh, particular procedure uh, to speed up, uh, of course, the, the, the research and the approvals. Um, we're working, so it's a big challenge. We're working in a lot of things at the same time, of course, uh, uh, any suggestion, it will be welcomed. Um, but yeah, so we, we, we are trying to, 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 to do things right and we are trying to, to, to help researchers uh, in every, every, every step of this.
Okay, the next question comes from Jennifer Henry, McGill, McGill University. What type of training do you require? Do you provide that training? Is it theoretical or and or practical? So, um, so what we we are going to re request is training in research ethics in general, like ethical considerations of research ethic protocols or of, in, of research protocols in general. Uh, regarding animal animal use, we need at least a you know a, a like a theoretical background regarding you know three R's and other principles uh, that will guide the the researchers in their design. But also, if if there are some um, specific procedures, we will require some train some training like practical training in some specific procedures if they are complicated. But what we do, what we are doing now is. Um, Usually, some researchers or some faculty members, they know how to do some procedures, and if their students go and they train them, it's okay. We, we still don't need a certification, like a formal certification. As a university, we're going to implement some certified training, like handling and practical, practical instances, but we have like two or three years to implement that. So and that's another step we're trying to but we will it will be required some handling and or practical and theoretical um, pra, um training this question <coughs> this question comes from edgar globos universidad dr Jose jose matias delgado many thanks for sharing your valuable experience for establishing a proper framework of regulation for research involving animals. The Chilean situation is somehow surprising given the importance of biomedical research for Chile's economy, but parallels the situation in many Latin American countries. What do you think is needed to implement the recently passed Chilean laws? And how could one improve the governance for checking that the law is implemented? Wow, that's a big question. Um, if I understood well, um, so the Regulation Act, it will be very important. Um, there are some some new, it will be very important if it comes up uh, soon, because it will give us, um, you know, the framework how to start applica applicating the law. Uh, about a year ago, uh, a regulation act, act came for the big animals, like the, the, the how do you call this tag? Uh, so it's an, a governmental institution that takes care of big animals, like, um, pro, like uh, food animals, like cows and meat, you know, to produce the, the you know, chickens and stuff to, to eat. Um, and Last year, it came a regulation act regarding how to uh, handle them. Also, this institution that is a governmental institution uh, makes some research in animals. And, and the regulation act just for them, for this institution, uh, because it's governmental, they have a particular regulation act, um, stated that um, they were going to follow basically the guide, right? It wasn't stated like that, but the principles that were follow that they decided to follow were, you know, the three R's and 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 you know all the principles that that you know are like universal principles, um, and that 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 is a big, you know, and, and major sign. So probably if a regulation act comes for our law uh, about animal protection. It will follow, of course, the international guidelines. And it will follow, I'm sure, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the guide. Um, I hope so. Uh, 
that's one thing. So we need the Regulation Act. So legally, we, we need, you know, we need, for us as a culture, we need something that say, okay, you should start applying this. But another thing is that training or education. We need to, to change people's mind here in our country and to show them that, that uh, you know, this is important and, and that we need, uh, we need to follow the, gui the, the guidelines. It's not because we want to and because, you know, I just decided to do it, but it, it has, you know, a sense. It, it makes sense to, you know, be responsible to do things right. I, I hope I, I answered your question, but, but I, I think it's, I, you know, uh, we need two things, you know, so, you know, the, the Regulation Act and some, you know, socialize and educate in good practices, you know, the whole country, not, not only in our institution locally. The, the next question is for Maria Andres, Cellular and Molecular Biology. What do you think would be the acceptable form for long experienced researchers to demonstrate their proficiency to work with animals? So I think, um, so there are there are researchers that we know that they have a lot of experience that they were trained abroad or they have a lot of of work done uh they have published a lot of work in terms of of so for, for long experience researchers so i believe that will be um enough maybe to 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 show you know how they work and how how or where they were trained um, because we know that 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 like uh, you know looks long experience as you say uh, researchers they it will be very hard to to make them uh, do the you know the online training or the practical training maybe the practical is not it's, it won't be necessary uh, unless it's a very as a new a new, I don't know, technique that is not, it was not implemented before in their labs. But maybe, you know, some, some particular, you know, concepts like theoretical, maybe basic. I think they w it would be nice to, the, this, this research just to, to refresh some, you know, concepts. And Jennifer Henry had another question. How did you get a statistician to participate? Do they get paid as a committee member? No. Um, so at the School of, of Medicine, uh, it was this statistician that was working before in our committee in, our, in the SEVA. Um, and he was, he's hired by the School of Medicine to help uh, the researchers in the um, research design and you know the, the groups and how how much samples do they need etc in, in different areas not only animals and and we at some point about two years ago we we asked him to be part of the SEVA I, I was I think it was in 2013 um, or 2000, at the end of 2012. And he was happy to participate uh, as a faculty member of the School of Medicine. So he doesn't get paid. He's very, he's, he's very helpful in, in the, the design of the experiment, the, the, you know, the research uh, design. Also, um, when we started recruiting um, faculty members uh, to come to compose our, our IACOC, uh, the Dean of Agronomy proposed a particular faculty member that he's uh, from the agronomy, he does some research in a, you know, the agronomical or agricultural field, but he had um, a specialization in statistics and methodology. And he's another one, he's not a statistician, but he's another, you know, very helpful person that knows a lot about, you know, uh, statistics and, 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 you know, group assignments, uh, group design and, you know, everything. So, so it, it was, we were lucky, I guess, uh, yeah. 
Okay, we uh, I think we're running out of time. I'd just like to state uh, mention a uh, comment that Robert Gump from FDA stated. Uh, Robert stated that it's not a question, but places in the U.S. are facing the same issues, so good luck. And so that concludes the session, and I think we had a couple of uh, questions that were not answered, and feel free to ask those questions offline directly to Andrea. And But I want to thank the audience for their great questions and, and the participation in today's event. Uh, know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 2015. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. So we'll see you next time and goodbye. And thank you, Andrea, again. That was a great, great presentation and we admire what you're doing.